Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Bendigo Amateur Radio and Electronics Club uh, for August 2022. Uh, tonight, we'll see the launch of the Barrack Field Operations Group. This will be the most important work that Barrack may ever do in preparation for regional emergency readiness. Bushfires are coming, and we'll get into that a bit later on. Welcome to the launch of the Barrack Field Operations Group. Um, the idea of the Field Operations Group is, as the name suggests, uh, to hone our skills in radio operations away from home and mains power. Now, I'm not going to waffle on like I did back in May. Uh, this is only a 2,000 word address, not an 8,000 word address, so you'll be, you can smell the pies, we'll get to them shortly. <laughs> The Field Operations Group is a special interest group, a SIG, within Barrack, but with the very special purpose of preparing for a regional emergency. There's no need to dwell on the observations made at our May meeting, except to say that we are in for a century of recurring climate emergencies, and that what we do now will have a bearing on outcomes for our communities into the future. But I will make the additional observation that just last week there were calls to dismantle Resilience New South Wales, the New South Wales government's response to the 2019-20 fires. This is perhaps more evidence that a locally based response is what will be needed in the coming years as an effective top-down approach has yet to be formulated to re disaster recovery. On a side note, it seems a pity that someone like Shane Fitzsimmons, who worked so hard to warn the New South Wales government of the Black Summer danger, was handed something of a poison chalice. So whatever he finished winding up doing, uh, we wish him well with that. Also announced this week, four of the seven major climate models predict a continuation of La Nina this summer. So this has brought us, a, brought us a bit of time before the next fire season. We probably won't get a big fire season this summer. We might get it the next one. So there is time for us to get some of this work done. But something I will reiterate is the need for Barracks Field Operations Group to safeguard its independence. It is we who are the experts. We need to do things our way. That is to say, in ways that we know work and not let others take control. That is a road to failure and we cannot afford failure. Some of you will have heard of the Tuskegee Airmen of World War II, an all black squadron of aviators who were segregated and vilified until one day they shot down three Messerschmitt 262 jet fighters over the Daimler-Benz factory in Germany. This got people's attention and they suddenly started being requested for bomber escort duty on major missions. The group was eventually awarded three presidential unit citations, the highest award which can be given to any organisation within the American military. A similar journey may await us. We need to work hard, then prove ourselves. After that, we may receive grudging acceptance, and after that, others will learn what we already know, that we are good, that we are very good. Accreditation is generally considered synonymous with competence and proficiency. But like control and oversight, accreditation, competence and proficiency are not matters that I believe should be in the hands of others. We will need to develop our own system of accreditation beyond licensing. A net controller accreditation is the first one that springs to mind. We are all competent operators, but being a net controller requires overcoming a certain reluctance and anxiety. Those who have been net controllers all say that they are better operators for it. Anxiety is reduced to simply taking a breath before speaking clearly and confidently into the microphone, while reluctance 
is relegated to an obscure magnetic concept. I'm glad somebody got that. And there's something else. You become more attentive and observant and better organised. A number of people have stepped up to do net control lately and there is not a bad one among them. Everyone starts out a bit nervous and disorganised but they all come good after a session or two. We've even had juniors acting as net controllers or at least assisting. It's simply a mindset and a skill set and that is what competence truly is. I propose therefore that a month of net control, four consecutive sessions, be a basic field operations accreditation. So by joining the field operations group, you are signing up for net control duty if you have not already done it. Other forms of accreditation will follow and I look forward to hearing people's ideas on what these may be. We may, for example, recognise HF and VHF accreditation, which are different in a number of ways. DX contact accreditation, which involves understanding propagation. SOTA and PARKS participation, which requires engaging with online systems. JOTA, which requires community engagement and working with children qualifications. Contesting, which requires speed, accuracy and understanding of rules. Digital modes, especially those we intend to use for during emergencies, Graham. First aid, something basic, but something useful. All of these are easily available to us now, and we already have competent specialists in our ranks. Shared, they can serve to raise and broaden the skills, competence, confidence, and cohesion of the group as a whole. Members of the field operations group need to be competent and work as a team. So a regime of training must be undertaken. A regime of training makes it sound harder than it is, so I'll pause there. Does what I just suggested make you feel uncomfortable? No. Well, it scares me a bit. But I hate not understanding this stuff. So what a great excuse to get busy and learn it. I also know that not knowing where to start is what always gets in my way, every time. So, let's try this. Choose a subject that I just mentioned, something you know nothing about, an activity you've never done. HF, VHF, DX, SOTA, PARKS, JOTA, contesting, digital modes, first aid, pick any of those you like. Just a question, Neil, sorry. Yes. Is this meant to be on the... No. No, that's good. That's okay. No, so pick any of those subjects, something that you're not comfortable with, something that you've never done. Everybody got one? Yep. Yeah. So, so. Now, close your eyes. You guys at home as well, close your eyes. You may feel out of your depth or something like that. Maybe you're thinking, this is a bad idea. I can't do this. Or even, I want to jump up out of my chair and run out the door. That's not unusual, by the way. Most adult learners panic at one time or another. So just sit with that uncomfortable feeling for a few moments and breathe. Just sit with that feeling. Now, it is August 2023, a year from now. August 2023. In the last 12 months, we've done a couple of sessions on this, learning from one of the guys who really understands it. I'm not an expert. I don't have the setup at home, but I understand it much better now. I'm not scared of it like I was before. I'm confident thinking and talking about it. Okay, open your eyes. Thanks for participating. Remember when you are feeling apprehensive to set aside your fear. 
Proficiency and competence require nothing more than your attention. You are, even now, a little more competent than you were only a moment ago. You've just completed our first group exercise. Congratulations, gentlemen and lady. Welcome to the Barrick Field Operations Group. Right. Uniforms. Most of us would recognise a scout when we see one. Scouts have uniforms. Scouts also get badges for all sorts of things once they're competent at them. Now there are times when field operations group members would also need to be recognisable. Is this some kind of elitism? No. All personnel involved in emergencies are recognisable by their uniform and their qualifications can be read by their patches. That's all of them do that. Most personnel responsible for site management will not concern themselves will someone, with someone who is obviously a member of that lot over there, even if they don't know exactly who that lot actually are. If you've got a uniform on and you're one of that lot, they tend to let you go. When I was working on towers some years ago, we were travelling all over the countryside, my team found ourselves in the town of Forster during a major flood event. This is before they became fashionable in New South Wales. It was raining and our group was walking along a partly flooded street dressed in hard hats and wet weather gear. A few of the residents greeted us as they passed and told us they were glad to see us, which was really nice in you know, country town. Then a policeman waved at us as he passed in, our, in his patrol car. This gave us pause as we realised that we were being mistaken for emergency service workers. Not knowing what trouble we might be heading for, we rather self-consciously returned to our trucks and quietly left town. But to me, this episode underscored the freedom of movement afforded to those in uniform during unusual circumstances. You don't need quite so much permission. If you're wearing civvies, you'll get stopped every time. You're wearing a uniform, part of a group, then you're there for a purpose. People don't need to know what the purpose is. They will not interfere with you. Uniforms also have a powerful effect on those wearing them. The sense of identity and unity they create raises both confidence and performance. You tend to step up. Is there a scope for uniforms and badges in the field operations group? I think so. Barrack already has a polo uniform, but field operations uniforms may need to be more robust and made from non-flammable materials such as drill cotton. So this is something to think about going forward, and I'll just leave that there. Equipment. I've been asked what we will be using in our field operations exercises, not by one person, but by several. Well, that's largely what tonight's show and tell is about. Initially, we will be using whatever we have to hand. But by sharing and combining ideas, we hope to develop a standardised field go kit with HF, VHF capability, antennas, and digital platforms that all of us will be competent to use. These kits will not be cheap and may run to about $3,000 each, depending on what the final configuration looks like. The first kits will be built from the new funding opportunities provided by Barrack's position in the Bendigo East Hall. Since we stand to make approximately $9,000 this financial year from that source alone, we are well placed to make a start. So depending on exact costings, we may be able to build two or perhaps three field kits in the coming 12 months. But to give some idea of our overall requirements, Operation Radar, which was discussed in May, will require eight outlying stations in the first instance, and we will almost certainly have to field our own personal equipment to make that happen. But once these first units are built and our emergency readiness credentials are established, we will be in a position to seek funding to build further kits. 
The remaining six to eight kits could be built using a grant allocation of about $20,000 from the City of Greater Bendigo, from the Bendigo Bank or some other, uh, some other agency. But this strategy requires us to demonstrate our commitment and expertise up front. We can then make a case to prospective partners on the argument of building capacity. So we can do this, but we don't have the money to do all of it. We need help with the money. Give us the money, we'll do it all. Like the recent antenna ant project, the trick is not to get ahead of ourselves. There are a number of unknowns in the early stages and we have to design our emergency readiness capability from the ground up. We cannot model our approach on anyone else's, not really. We can borrow ideas and adapt elements from elsewhere, of course. But what we are doing is not the same as, say, in the US. What we are doing is new and unique, so every step needs to be taken in turn. That way we don't mess it up and we're able to take advantage of new opportunities and ideas as they arise during the development process. To do this any other way assumes that we already know exactly what we are going to be doing and how. And the fact is, we don't know those things. To everyone who brought along any piece of gear tonight, thank you. It doesn't matter what it is, you've made a contribution to the group's knowledge just by showing it to us. And it is amazing what happens when you get a few minds working on the same idea. So let's all take a look at what people have been working on. That's it. This is the, the kit that I use for summits on the air. It's um, a homemade four band transceiver based on the bit X design. Um, mainly because I like building stuff. Um, that's not the most interesting thing. The, the aerial is a 80 metre offset of head, and in the middle there's frequency compensating elements, so I don't need an antenna tuner to use it on 80, 40 or 20. Absolutely no good on, on 10 meg. Um, and it's got everything I need there, including the string to tie it, so... Yeah. If I can find somewhere to put the squid pole up, the ends can be just tied off at ground level when the old tussock of grass. Um, standard squid pole, um, but it also doubles the, the um, cylinder that it's in, doubles as a carrier for all the crap that you need to tie it to something. So a couple of bits of rope, tape, very important to tape the coax so you don't pull the end off your coax. Um, oh, feeder, always carry a spare, um, and one unusual thing, wind at figure eight around my hands because that way when you're throwing it out in the field, you just grab one in and run off with it. If you spool it up neatly, you'll eventually get it all twisted. Um, uh, what else? Um, two metre Yagi that doubles as a walking stick. I won't assemble it because I don't want to poke anyone's eye out. Um, that's an idea I stole off Glenn, Glenn VK3YY. The um, idea of everything's inside so when I get the wobbles when I'm out walking, it's a handy stick. Um, apart from that, um, handheld, two metre mainly, and what else is there? Uh, very important, checklist. I've got a shocking memory, so it's one thing I'd suggest for the field operations group, is to have a checklist for everything. And finally, logging. So all of that packs up and I can carry it some distance before I run out of steam. Ah, thanks. Yeah, name's uh, David, VK3UCD. And um, I've just been um, experimenting with linked dipoles, poles, an easy, w an easy way of making them, so we're a little bit different way. So um, I'll just go through the details roughly. So, uh, centre insulator is made out of uh, a bit of PVC pipe. There, so um, 
put the various holes in, cables RG174, it's a two band one this one. And uh, what I do, I put a nice square cross on a bit of paper so I can divide the markings where I'm putting the holes into about four places and uh, then I put it on a square and uh, draw four lines down. I take my measurements from there. The two holes at the back, you put a cable tie through and you just cable tie it to the um, telescopic mast. And um, where the uh, wires connect in the centre here to the coax, I just use um, a five minute arrow diet is what I use. Um, you just got to keep an eye on it, it tries to run a bit so you, you move it around. So I have all these wires sticking out for a start, then I pull them all back before I cable, lock them with cable ties. So it um, works quite well. And the links, so I use um, plastic chain, you get from any hardware store, the, like a safety or a barrier chain. But it's quite okay for this purpose and uh, no need to drill holes or anything. You just put the wire around either tied or cable ties. And uh, I use spade connectors on these. So you can use crocodile clips, but um, they can corrode after a while. So I use spade connectors. So they, they are, they're nickel plated um, brass or whatever, so they won't corrode. And uh, most of the time, I use a uh, 10 metre squid pole. You don't use the top section because they're a bit thin. But what I do, because I cable tie it to the, uh, to the mast, I'll pull this out. I've got a bit of electrical tape. And I might have to walk back for this. There you are. See where the uh, green electrical tape is? That's uh, around eight metres. And notice how thick the pole is there. So you can put it up, stand it up in your stand or whatever, and uh, you can get the thing up eight, even eight and a half metres, and the pole is quite thick. And at that height, the angle between the wires, I think it's around 100 degrees, which is still quite um, acceptable, acceptable for an inverted V. So you, if you get over nine metres, and you've got the ends about two metres off the ground, you you're getting under 90 degrees, which is probably a bit undesirable. It, the um, bandwidth of the antenna gets narrow and your impedance drops. So um, that's uh, why I uh, worked that one out. And it does, they really perform well if you get them up a bit. I hold the ends up with these uh, electric fence um, supports here. That, that They just spike into the ground and um, about three metres of rope also, so you can get the ends off the ground probably two, two and a half metres. So for a portable setup, that, that works pretty well. So and pretty well get like home station performance. I spoke to a bloke in southern Tasmania on it and he would give me five and nine down there. So and he's using a homemade five watt radio and uh, out in the bush, operating portable again. So we had a really good QSO. So um, anyway, that's about it. So uh, thanks. Anyway, that's uh, I don't mind mucking around with wire antennas, and it's a bit of a uh, bit of fun there. So just just some ideas I had there. Anyway, thank you. Good. Hi there, I'm Graham VK3GRK, and I'm going to attempt to explain some of my uh, portable portable equipment, which is uh, somewhat evolving. Uh, so, but you have to start from somewhere. So first of all, um, uh, this is my um, FT897, Yosu897, this is a really good field radio. Does uh, HF, VHF and UHF. So uh, I find that really nice to operate in the field. Um, I'll actually explain a little bit about the, an the antenna. So this is my 40 metre dipole. Um, <clears throat> and it looks a bit rough and ready, but there's actually a story to it, and I'll, I'll explain what the story is. So, several years ago I went camping, and I went camping at uh, Mount Franklin. And uh, I was there for a few days, and I, I got bored one day, and I had some coaxial cable and wire and so forth in the boot of my car. So I thought, oh no, I'll make a 40 metre antenna, as you do. Um, so, because um, I had my radio gear with me, so I actually um, 
used a, a stick that I found on the ground to actually um, gaffer tape the wire to it for support. Uh, and um, I've been using it ever since. I'd actually, since after that, I'd actually um, took the tape off and soldered it. Uh, so, um, so there's a little bit of um, history there as to why I still like to use this antenna. Um, and uh, I've got the, I've since put a piece of flexible plumbing pipe that actually fits over the top of the squid pole, uh, and that actually sits straight uh, when it's vertical. And uh, so that slides nicely over the uh, top of the squid pole. Uh, when you're putting it away in the boot, you can take it off and fold the squid, squid pole up. Um, and uh, so... Uh, uh, no, it's a, no, it's actually just to actually, uh, it's a way of fitting the actual uh, die pole on the actual squid pole. So I'll just demonstrate. So, and we'll take that off like that. Uh, I'll have to use this squid pole. <coughs> Hang on. Yeah, can you get it? Yeah. Uh, might be able to. <laughs> you don't normally put there. Right? I've got it done. You don't normally install these things inside like that, but uh, so um, yeah, I've got it. So <clears throat> so the idea is the it's just a way of actually attaching it to the top of the squid pole. See, like that. Um, yeah, and that, that's all, so yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's flexible, flexible, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's all, and uh, there's no, there's no balance at all there, it's just uh, directly connected, yeah, it looks a bit rough, would I do the same thing if I made another one? No, I wouldn't, uh, but there's just a little bit of history attached to um, uh, why I just still use it, because it worked really well at the time, and I just, you know, uh, I still use it that way, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> So, um, so this just goes to show how easy you can actually put a dipole together, uh, and they work and they work really well. Um, so that's the um, dipole, and I've got um, string string uh, on the end of it, so I can uncoil the string and put it on, onto a tree or something like that. Uh, or I can use uh, tent pegs either end, um, or on a barbed wire fence or something like that, and. Um, so it works really well. Now, uh, do I use an antenna tuning unit? No, I don't, because the dipole is tuned. I throw the dipole up. Every time I throw it up, the SWR is really low. Uh, it's very low or non-existent uh, as far as uh, SWR goes. So um, that just it just works really well. And um, uh, so yeah, so I don't use an antenna tuning unit. So I've got my coaxial cable, of course. Uh, that goes goes in the in the in the boot in the kit, uh, and I have this is invaluable a battery box. Uh, it has um, your USB connectors on there. Uh, it's got your cigarette lighter style 12 volt connector. It's got a, a, an, an on switch that tells you the uh, voltage. Uh, so it's reading 12.7 volts there. And it's got your Anderson connectors, and I'm actually the next step I'm going to do is actually convert uh, the large Anderson connectors to the smaller ones because I use the smaller one for my uh, radio. That's my my radio connector, uh, which I can actually uh, connect to these alligator clips. Uh, I've got that on the end of the alligator clips, which I can actually connect these to the battery box uh, on these on these uh, wing nuts here. Uh, connect directly to the battery, so uh, so that works fairly well for now. But I will actually do an Anderson connector uh, converter for for these ones. Um, so I take my handheld with me just just in case, and I use a uh, Retivus microphone on the Bayo thing there. Uh, can be quite handy to take with you if you're in range of uh, repeaters. Um, uh, I also have my uh, book here that I can actually use for manually logging if I need to. However, on my phone, uh, I use a, uh, an app called uh, VK Portalog uh, on my smartphone for Android. And I find VK Portalog very good to use for SOTA, silos on the air, etc. Uh, so look up VK Portalog, it's really handy to use in the field. Always, always handy of course to have uh, pen and paper, 
and um, if anybody comes along and says, um, what weird thing are you up to? I can explain what amateur radio is and I can give them some information with uh, some contact details about the club on the back. It's always good to have information uh, if you're uh, out and about for people to, uh, to take. Um, so I think that is about it. Um, and I will actually gradually consolidate things and probably have a proper case to put the radio in, etc., and look at having a laptop and so forth. Um, but for now, it works really well. I just make sure I've got it all in the car, and um, it doesn't take very long to set up at all. Um, and uh, so, so that's my field radio equipment. Yeah, hi Craig. It's uh, Don uh, VK3 PDB, secretary of the uh, Bendigo Amateur Radio and Electronics Club, and this is my uh, first attempt at a go kit. So I've uh, taken my uh, two metre Kenwood 281, uh, mounted that into the uh, into the case, run it through to a 12 volt um, 7 amp hour battery, um, antenna wire out here onto a J pole, and the J pole's not tuned at the moment. I've got another one at home which uh, uh, run I run regularly. Um, but being a first attempt, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, it, it works. I ran it on the net this week uh, out of the suitcase. But I think the suitcase is just not quite rigid enough, not quite um, heavy duty enough. So I'll probably change that and get something a little bit bigger that I can put a HF rig in as well. And that, that'll give me uh, pretty much everything I need uh, for a uh, mobile go kit. Um, what else have I brought? Oh, and I, I just watching you with uh, Graham and his uh, 40 metre dipole. Based on his design, I've um, built a an 80 metre, oh, sorry, 40 metre dipole as well. Um, and yet to be tested. So hopefully we'll do another silo activation in the next couple of weeks, and we'll take that out and try it as well. Um, and then the only other thing I've got is just the log sheet from the weekend uh, from the RD contest and all the other contacts that we made uh, on Saturday and Sunday. So it's been uh, really interesting. Um, the difference with this j pole compared to my other one, the one that I built first only had a one join here, so it split into two and I've uh, decided to break this one down into smaller sections so it'll actually fit in the go kit. The only problem is the go kit has to be that long because I can't... Oh, I could probably cut that there, um, but no, I'd still have to put another joiner in there. So it's a sort of a job in progress, but this one's got to be tuned. But it breaks down pretty well into a small, small bits, and I'm really keen to see that it works as well as the one at home. Um, the, the, um, the, the copper pipe, surprising enough, I... Um, stay there. I went to the, um, the old... Uh, the hardware store down in Wood Street, um, Bendigo Trailers, and he had that one piece of copper pipe, I don't know, about 10 foot long, and it uh, cost me 10 bucks. So all in all, with the connectors and everything else, I probably built that for less than $50. So I'm pretty happy with, uh, hopefully it just it works. Anyway, thanks very much. Hi, I'm Neil, VK3ZVX. Uh, this is my take on a uh, go kit. Uh, it's built into a 25 millimeter ammunition crate. Uh, which are available from Aussie Disposals for about 50 odd dollars. Uh, inside the crate there's an IC706 and an FT8800. Uh, they're built onto an internal chassis uh, which is completely removable for servicing. So take that out of there like that. Uh, the chassis contains the two radios, uh, two 
lithium iron phosphate batteries at 10 amp hours each. Uh, there will be a charger unit for the batteries here, um, possibly a, another charger unit for the computer and this is uh, an early model of an SDR play. So this uh, unit has HF, VHF and SDR capability, so it is literally a shack in a box. Uh, the other thing that happens with this is that when you, just give me a second. That all slides into there. The microphones can get put away. And then the computer is folded up and goes into the compartment underneath the radio, so the whole thing is completely self-contained. Um, the case is, has got a rubber seal on it with overlocking compression clamps, uh, so that it's absolutely waterproof under all circumstances. Uh, there are no penetrations through the box. It's not quite complete yet. There is a, uh, a bracket missing off the front here, which will have the power entry and coaxial cable entry points uh, at the front of the box accessible. Uh, but when it's all opened up and set up, um, we'll go through that process again. It's fairly straightforward. And it goes in there like that. with the computer open, from the operator's position, you've got access to the keyboard, you've got full visual on the screen, and you've got access to all the controls on both radios. So, uh, this is actually a prototype of a field operations radio, in, I think. Uh, it's certainly got all the makings of one. Uh, my name's Chris uh, McGrath, my call sign's VK3HFZ. Um, fairly small setup, only been doing it for probably about six months of trying to get into SOTA. So here I've got a bazooka antenna on two metres, which I've set up, a pretty basic kind of an antenna. Basically can string that up in a tree and use that uh, for portable operations. Um, works quite well, I've made contact on sideband with that. Um, this antenna here is an in-fed um, uh, half wave dipole so yeah that was a, a homemade uh, 49 to 1 ballon a little capacitor in there I've, uh, I've employed these little clips they actually work quite well for clipping around branches and trees and you can also extend them out so that if you need to you can um, you can shorten or lengthen the rope and that's just uh, some paracord that I use to tie up the end of the, the antenna I usually go out with a squid pole um, so you just pop that up and make a, a V out of it. But worst case scenario, I, I have just thrown it up in a tree and it works quite well. Um, yeah, made contacts in, uh, in basically VK4, VK3, VK2. So it's been pretty good. And uh, the rig I get, it got is a, an FT818. Um, pretty good rig, um, works quite well. Good receive sensitivity. I actually picked up a... Um, a portable contact, um, he was actually uh, pedestrian mobile with, the, with that rig. Um, it was surprising I could get him. I only just made him out. Um, he couldn't hear me, but I did hear him make the contact with another, another ham radio operator. And uh, yeah, just got a bit of a, a kit here, first aid, um, sleeping bag, um, a little annex so I can make up a bivy, and you know, of course uh, the log book. And um, yeah, a little um, uh, camp oven so I can have some, do overnighters. So yeah, that's pretty much uh, my setup. This is Craig VK3KLI and a look at my Radio Go box for SOTA and field operations. The carry case is a heavy duty case. Uh, this particular one's from Super Cheap Auto. And I'm carrying the FT818 all mode all band QRP transceiver. There's an extra battery there. I also carry a VHF UHF handheld, uh, an earphone for noisy or busy environments, the logging sheet, P 
depends a clock set to UTC time. Uh, this is the Soda Beam's 40 20 meter wire dipole antenna, and that's used in the field with a squid pole to hoist it up. There's also straps, tape, cable ties, and a checklist. This is the box packed up uh, for Soda operations on Mount Macedon at uh, one stage. And a look at the box again on the picnic table at Mount Macedon. And that is ice on the table. It was a pretty cold morning, but still managed to complete the activation of Mount Macedon. There's also some uh, higher gain antennas for VHF, UHF, and a telescopic one for VHF and 15 metres.